Susan, are you the speaker today? I'm, I'm sorry, Tom, what was that? Are you the speaker today? I am not, no. Okay. All right, folks, well, we're going to start getting towards getting started, right. but don't rush those that are guys. getting lunch. We've got some folks online that have been doing a great job of chatting, so thanks, you guys. Make sure <laughs> you put, if you have any links, just like Susan's done, put them in the chat there, and we'll share that. I still don't know how to get my picture up. All right, it's in your it's in your uh, your video settings. We're going to get the program started in here. I'm going to welcome Sharla, our president, to get things going. So, Sharla, come on up. Oh. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the um, Swim Chamber of Commerce luncheon. I'm Sharla Wright, and I'm the president of the Chamber of 2021, and it's my honor to welcome everyone here. Many thanks to those of us who are joining us on a live stream, kind of uh, the new way this time of year. Uh, Facebook. <laughs> Is that the Facebook? No, it's just, it'll be on YouTube. Oh, there you go. All right. Well, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that as we gather today, we are on ancestral homelands of the Skyland people who have lived on these lands from immemorial time. Please join me in expressing and our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors, the Sklalems and the other Salish people for their enduring stewardship and protection of our shared lands and waterways. We are grateful for your hospitality and support of the business community. So if you haven't noticed already, there is a business or a, a card at your setting and that game card is um, part of our game, our uh, networking game. So your goal is to find like cards. So all the hearts need to find the hearts and all the clubs need to find the clubs, etc. And so just kind of get to know, introduce yourself because there's a lot of new faces here. It's been a while since we actually have had the opportunity to meet in person. Um, and so we want to encourage you to get to know your neighbor. So, yeah. Great. Next up is our membership report, and Tristan is going to give that. Today, we would like to thank the following members who have joined us since the past luncheon. Our new members are the Back Alley Cafe, Workhorse, Squim Makers Market, and the Economic Development Council. Our new, our, excuse me, our renewing members are Wilder Auto and RV, North Olympic Library System, Home and Stead Senior Care, Evergreen Home Loans, Properties by Landmark, Caregivers Home Health Squim, Elk Creek Apartments, North Olympic Library System, Nurse Squim, Sea Siren Skin Care, Squim Masonic Lodge, Home Instead Senior Care, Port Angeles Marathon Association, Evergreen Home Loans, Olympic Ambulance, Properties by Landmark, Flourish Lavender of Lost Mountain, Hurricane Ridge Veterinary Hospital, Olympic Community Action Programs, Olympic Tax and Business Consulting, LLC and CPAs, Port Angeles Symphony Orchestra, Squim Farmers and Artisans Market, Sunshine Cafe, the Squim Free Clinic, Dungeness Valley Health and Wellness Clinic, and Peninsula Mortgage. Our individual member who is rejoining today is Joe Borden. So as you can tell, there's lots of new members and renewing members, and we'd like to give a huge thank you to everyone. And we are able to support, inform, and advocate for our business community because of all of your support. So thank you so much, and let's give everyone a big round of applause. Our next ribbon cutting will be on August 12th at the Sound Community Bank's new Creekside branch. So please join us there from four to 6 p.m. There will be beer, wine, and light refreshments provided. 
um, in addition to uh, raffle prizes. Finally, you may have noticed that there's a sign-up sheet as you enter today, and that's a multi-purpose sign-up sheet. So you can choose to join or sign up to have more information on the Ambassadors Club, the membership committee, or even uh, information on our upcoming golf tournament. So if you'd like inf more information on that, then please sign up. So now we are going to go through with our other announcements and we will bring up Lori. Hi, everybody. It's good to see your smiling faces. Super excited to make an announcement to piggyback on what Tristan just was mentioning to get more information on our first annual golf tournament that we are super excited. It's going to be held on August 14th. And um, we are um, really wanting to get this out there so that, you know, we're super excited for you guys to host or uh, play in the tournament with your family and your friends, your cool, your coworkers. It's going to be a fun filled day. I've helped with quite a few golf tournaments um, in the past. It's going to be on uh, the Cedars at Dungeness, their golf course. And in our tournament, it's going to feature some fun things that we're going to do. We're going to have business card bingo, some local swag bags, networking with business leaders, green carpet photo shoot, green carpet, get it on the greens. How fun is that? <laughs> and some wild prizes. The goal of our event is to connect leaders in our business communities here. All profits from the tournament will benefit our Howard Woods Scholarship Fund, designated for the Squim High School seniors pursuing a future career in business or career technical education. So we have a number of sponsorship opportunities available for you guys today. If you'd like to inquire on those, our intention is to hold this tournament each year, like all the other tournaments that you see in our local areas to raise, raise funds for whatever their cause might be. Um, our premier sponsors will receive the first right of refu refusal for our future golf tournaments run by the chamber. Our marketing team will work with you to ensure that your brand, the business and the businesses are best represented at this event. Um, to secure your sponsorship, please connect with one of our chamber board members or the chamber itself by calling it there. Does. And we'd like to have that happen by um, who I am. the August 2nd before the tournament is to start. So please see me afterwards, or you can see Angie or any of our members that remembered to wear their name tag today. <laughs> so enjoy your lunch, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, we have a, a special little announcement to make, a, a thank you to make. Um, I'm gonna invite Jim and Olivia up right now. And he's gonna say some words. Uh -oh. It'll be a long day. Hello, good afternoon. I'm uh, Jim Stopper, the past president. And I have Olivia Preston here, who was our uh, student rep for the chamber. She's uh, gonna head off to Hawaii Pacific University. I don't know why, because we have all this good stuff here in SQUIM. But um, I wanted to, we have a card and there's some monetary stuff in here. It, it, it might help a college student in Hawaii. And so I present Olivia Preston and uh, the mic is yours. Thank you. Like I didn't prepare anything, I was not told to, but um, I was given the opportunity to serve on the Chamber of Commerce this past year, and I was given the opportunity to serve on the SWIM School Board the last two years. It has been such an amazing experience. I've gained a lot of um, opportunities and just being able to see what I want to do for myself and what I want to do in my future 
you all of you guys have kind of shaped me to who I am today. So I appreciate every one of you guys and everyone that has helped me throughout this way. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Olivia. And, and it's very important to have the what we call student voice on all these boards um, across the city because uh, sometimes us adults just need to step out of the way and uh, not get in the way of our students. And Olivia here and uh, Madeline, who's not here today, she's our senior rep for this next year. Just fabulous work um, of keeping us uh, keeping us real on what is truly important. That's our students um, in the, throughout our whole area here. So thank you again, Olivia. Oh, my speech continues. I told you it was gonna be long. So um, citizen of the year luncheon. So first I need everybody to stand up as uh, everybody here has pretty much been in the citizen of the year. If you don't stand up, then you weren't a citizen of the year. And, uh, but uh, it didn't happen unless we take the picture too. So smile, let's see, I get, might have to do sure a, you don't want to get in it too? nah, I'm in too many of these, so it's all right. <laughs> And somebody might post a picture of me not wearing a mask, you know, and that would be bad. But only kidding. All right, thank you. Well, thank you. this will be on Facebook in about <laughs> four seconds. So, um, Citizen of the Year luncheon. The Citizens of the Year committees and the Squim Dungeness Valley Chamber were proud to recognize the essential workers for the 2020 Citizen of the Year. Now, previously, you know, there's a one person or two get selected. But we know that so many folks in our community were involved since in our community, keeping us safe and healthy and, and uh, businesses working, um, restaurants, so forth uh, through since March, 2020. So that's, uh, it was uh, an honor for, and a privilege to hear that discussion of uh, how it's, it well, literally takes a village out there. And so just to name off a few things, you know, we have like uh, the city of Squam staff and volunteers, fire district three staff and volunteers, CERT members, daycare workers, food bank staff and volunteers, Squam school district staff and volunteers, grocery stores, because, you know, everybody had that run on toilet paper and you had to stock up or you had to go to a, had to go to one of those grocery stores to get that um, or one of those other stores. Um, Postal Service, uh, all those uh, essential workers, public transit workers, restaurants, um, hospitality workers, uh, Olympic Medical Center and volunteers, healthcare personnel and first responders. So a big thank you. So if I could have a huge round of applause for yourself, Steve. So typically we also have this big to do luncheon, you know, you have to dress up in uh, um, the guys in our tuxes, if we have those girls in your formal wear um, as where's Lori, Lori's usually, yeah, there we go. Um, so um, what we're going to do is the picnic in the park, which we traditionally hold at the end of summer at Pioneer Park, which you know, center of our town there. So mark your calendars now. And I have proof that you were you heard the announcement. So if you're not there on uh, August 25th, then uh, there'll be a conversation where you were at. Um, we're inviting our legislators and other local leaders to attend that and expressing our gratitude for all of us, all, this whole community, for uh, keeping us together through uh, the last since March 2020. And you can actually register for that luncheon today. So uh, there's Wi-Fi here. So uh, pull out your phone, start registering right now. And um, so we're also gonna do a virtual component, right? And- uh, We have a live stream, but we'll have a video. Okay. And if you're unable to attend, we have a, we're taking pictures, documenting the event, and we'll share that afterwards. So again, thank you everybody for all their work and all those community volunteers out there. I know I saw many of you in, in line, either directing traffic, handing out food boxes, um, all sorts of stuff. So thank you again. You knew it was dangerous to give him a microphone for a 
<laughs> um, and if anybody else here that wants to make an announcement, go ahead and come line up behind Emily because she's next. And also those of you who are joining us online, I'm gonna call on you after all of the in-person announcements have been made. So get ready to hit the unmute button. Emily, go ahead. I know, another Emily. There were no Emily's when I grew up and it was sort of a weird name and I was kind of a weird kid. So I didn't <laughs> need a weird name to go with it. Now there's millions of weird little Emily's out there. So my name is Emily Westcott. I'm here for two things. One, to thank you if you sponsored a Squim Flower Basket. And two, if you didn't sponsor a Squim Flower Basket, it's never too late. I pretty much know in this room who has not sponsored a Squim Flower Basket. So I'll visit with you before we leave today. It's $100 to sponsor a basket. Um, I raise the money. I give the high school $7,000 to make the baskets. The rest money that's left over, I use for flowers around town and for our Christmas decorations. And we've done really, really well this year. I was up, that's why I was late today out, putting tags up so people will know where their basket is. So if you haven't had a chance to do that, I'll catch up with you. The second thing is the uh, Squim Fly-In, the Air Affair. It's the 28th of August. We're doing it just on a Saturday this year. It's out at Squim Valley Airport. Price is just right, $10 a car load. Bring a big car, put a lot of people in it. Have a lot of fun. We have food, music. On the back, it tells you what's going on. Uh, radio control, that's the RC controls. They uh, do a really great job back behind the hangars. There's a car show and shine. Antique cars will be there this year too. Mike Mason will bring the wing walker by. If you've never seen that, that's an experience. They cannot get up on the plane when they're on the ground. They have to climb up in the plane after the plane is up in the air. I have to show you. And then they fly like this. And then the plane goes, yeah, yeah. And that body's standing up there like a stick. I'm like, oh my, I'm not doing that one. Crystal did it. She said it was awful. I said, what'd you think it was gonna be standing on top of an airplane going 125 miles an hour flying upside down, crazy. So he's gonna be there. And let's see, um, I think we'll probably have a tether balloon there so that if people wanna go up and tether, there's always food, there's always music. It's a great day. Um, everybody loves it. Of course, airplanes all have to do with weather. So we're about half and half. This is our ninth one and about half of them, the weather's been great and half of them, not so great. So let's hope that the weather's really great this year. Then the other one, just a plug for me, I've been out there keeping the, the town nice and clean. I think it looks good. A shout out and thank you to the people from the chamber that went down and helped us clean up Wednesday Park. That was a pretty big task, not because the task was so big, but because it was like 95 degrees. Saturday, we started at 8. Sunday, we started at 6.30. It was really hot. They have since gone in and put down new bark for the floor. So it looks pretty nice. So things are looking pretty good. I'm going to toss some of these on your table. Come on out to the air fair and enjoy it. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Emily and I'm the volunteer coordinator for Shirt Hospice. Um, we are looking for volunteers to come join our team. Um, volunteering looks different for each person in each home. Um, it depends on your availability. It depends on like what you're comfortable doing. Um, our volunteers do not administer medication. Um, we don't give fluids or transport patients. Um, our role is kind of just to provide companionship and emotional support. Um, you can read to the patient, you can walk their pet if they have one. Um, it's all about just providing them comfort and support. Um, we also have like administrative uh, opportunities. You can come and do admission folders or come meet the office staff and um, do some check-in calls to the patients. Um, we don't require any experience and um, yeah, we offer all education and training. Um, if you wanted to come join our team, feel free to call the office um, and just ask for Emily. And I'd love to tell you more if you want to volunteer. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathleen Dashiell from the city of Swim, and I'm the marketing coordinator 
and we've been working on um, profiles of people of SQUIM. This is a, a project where we tell the stories of some of the unique people and how they make their living in SQUIM. And so some of those stories have been posted on our tourism website. Visit sunnysquim.com under things to do. Um, you can click on meet the people of SQUIM. And so if anybody in this room is interested in participating in that, let me know. I have my cards here. You can email me, call me. I'd love to talk to you about that project. It's been a lot of fun and really interesting. Um, I just completed the one on Greg McDonald. He is the president of the Lighthouse Keepers Association, and that was really interesting. So that one will be going up on the website real soon. I'm also here because I wear another hat and that is uh, preparing for our ninth annual back to school fair. And this is an effort of several people, different uh, organizations and individuals in our community who want to help children start the new school year with everything they need to be a success. So what we do is we hand out school supplies and backpacks and we offer different services for families in need. This is for our SQUIM community. We kept it as a drive-through venue for this year because of, you know, COVID. So we also added a vaccination clinic. This happens on August 28th and it starts in the stadium parking lot on First Street. And so people can just drive through and get what they need for their kids. Um, we have openings for volunteers, we need sponsors to help with um, making donations so that we can buy enough school supplies. We always run out of backpacks. Um, we also need vendors. We're going to allow vendors to be along the drive-through route. If you have something, information to hand out or something that would be useful to uh, school families, please contact me about that. And um, what else do we need? Just help get the word out about this outreach because it is really important. Last year, we helped over 600 kids and there's been other years where there, there have been 900. So like I said, this is our ninth annual one. The need is there. <clears throat> I know that um, the school district usually has around 50% of the, the school families at free and reduced lunch rates which means that they're at the poverty level or below. So there's a lot of need there. And it's a great community. So many people come together to make this happen. We have um, school supply drives going on in some locations right now. If you'd be interested in sponsoring one of those at your place of business, let me know and we'll get you set up. Thank you. Hey, my name is JC Wakefield, and I'm the new development director for United Way. I'm really excited to be a part of such an amazing organization that gives back to our community. Um, and I placed these on everybody's table. Um, I want to tell you about our, it's our annual fundraising event, and um, we decided to go big this year and do um, an event here at Club 7, and it's um, a champagne and cupcake brunch, and um, it's going to be really, really fun. We have goodie bags for all the attendees uh, that are going to be full of um, high-end local goods, and we have a really special guest speaker. His name's Greg Benick, and uh, he's a TEDx speaker, and he's really entertaining, and he juggles a lot, and uh, he's really fun. So we're really excited and there's still room for some sponsors. Um, we have some amazing sponsors already, but there's still room for some sponsorships. So if anybody's interested, we have a really good marketing package that we can uh, offer you and uh, come find me or you can get a hold of us at United Way. We're excited. We want to pack the house. Uh, this is my baby. So I want to make it a success. So I hope you guys come. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bridget. I'm a new member of the chamber. Thank you so much for having me as a small business owner. But I'm here today as special events coordinator for KSQMF. I'm 91.5. Your listeners supported radio. 
And I know we have another broadcaster here back in the house. I'm going to see Sorensen here. Um, so we're in week six of our uh, Music Radio Park Summer Series produced by KSQM Radio. Tonight, we're going to be at Purple Haze Lavender. The shows always start at six o'clock on a Tuesday. We've got John Hoover and the Mighty Quinns. And he does fantastic John Denver covers and a lot of great original music. If you can't join us, we certainly do hope you'll join us for this free event. If you can't join, you can listen to John, an interview that we did a couple weeks ago with some live music on the station or on our, st our streaming service, which you can listen to anywhere in the world. So when you're getting back out there and traveling, tune in, listen to KSTM FM, get our local news and all that good stuff. So as we move into week seven, every August, uh, six o'clock, Carrie Blake Park at the Band Hall, working with Pat Seen. Thank you, Pat Seen. She, yes, thank you. She's been teaching me a lot, along with Barbara and, of course, our folks at the Public Works Department who are fantastic. Every Tuesday, six o'clock, Carrie Blake Park, every single Tuesday of August, you'll have a number of bands. Uh, Stardust featuring Sarah, uh, Sarah Shea. We have the Navy Band. They're going to do a rock and roll segment. Buck Ellard for some country, bread and gravy, and uh, Black Diamond Junction. And then the Pièce de Résistance, the grand finale, will be September 11, Patriots Day. KSQM is combining that uh, with Music Ray Bark as an annual event. And then, of course, it's to celebrate pets. I know there's a lot of pet lovers there. So we're expecting a big turnout for that September 11th. Again, Cary Blake Park, and we're looking for vendors. So come see me if you're someone who has a, you know, interest in pets or Patriots Day or whatever, but at least come out and see the music. And that show starts at 11 to 3. We'll have Tess Teal do her trio setup, fabulous jazz. And then we'll wrap up the afternoon with Don Martin and Sound Advice. So that's my radio voice, ladies and gentlemen. But if you <laughs> thank you so much, have a good day. Thank you. Good afternoon. So we got to meet the new development director at United Way, and I'm the old development director at Peninsula Behavioral Health. Uh, so I two quick things. I wanted to take a minute to introduce Kathy Stevens, who is our chief operations officer. Um, as many of you know. PBH is just growing like mad. So this is a, a new, new job role for, for Kathy and we're thrilled to have her there. Um, and as with most development people, we like to talk about events and fundraising opportunities. Um, we're gonna be back here on October 1st. We've got a terrific guest speaker, Stephanie Land. Um, tickets will be on sale by the time I get back to the office this afternoon, I'm hoping. And I know there's several of you in the audience who have been there before and can vouch for it. It's a great night. So thanks so much. I forgot. We also need vendors at the Era Fair and we need sponsors. Our biggest and best sponsor that everybody loves to sign up for is to sponsor a Santa can. Every She's looking at me like, are you serious? Everybody goes and you get your name all over the Santa can and you can decorate it any way you want to. So $250 to sponsor a Santa can let me know and we need food vendors thank you i forgot that part so it probably would have been best when i came up last time to say my name is Lori fazio and i am a chamber board member here for the swim chamber and the acting treasurer and so i'm here to represent um McClellan County EDC as the business relationship manager. And I just wanted to inform everybody that Lifeboat 3 is in effect and it's coming soon. And the McClellan County commissioners have already committed to starting the distribution of up to $3 million to our local community. <laughs> and that is going to be from the, uh, I have to remember this, the American Rescue Plan Act funds. And it's going to benefit those small businesses in our area that were the most hardly affected 
by COVID and also those that were unable to receive any type of federal funding. So if you have any questions on that or you know of a business that could benefit from these funds that are going, going to be distributed, please let me know. And also you can check out our newsletter and our website at the Clown County EDC. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Smith. I'm the executive director of Shipley Center, which is uh, the senior center here in the swim area. And a couple of exciting things. Our design review is underway at the city of Squim. So we've turned in all of our engineering, uh, mechanical, civil, structural, landscape plan, what color is the building going to be. Turn that in. So, so we have high hopes to get that out of, out of that uh, process and onto a building permit. The other thing is our biggest fundraiser of the year, the annual benefit sale. It's our 16th annual sale. 10% of that goes to high school students for scholarships. So we gave out $6,000 this last year for high school scholarships just on the basis of the, the performance of that sale last year that did an amazing $53,000. We have so much furniture for sale. We're turning down furniture uh, right now. So um, furniture is actually for sale every Friday, Saturday, and Monday, 10 to 2. And then the big sale will be where everything's for sale is August 5 and 6 and 5, 6 and 7. Five for members of Shipley Center. You can become a member for 50 bucks a year. What a deal. And some people actually buy a membership at the door of the sale so they can get in on Members Day. But for the public, it's August 6 and 7. So we encourage you to come support your local senior center and the uh, scholarship funds that come from that as well and support our building project as you see it moving along in the future, thanks. Hi ladies and gentlemen, my name is um, short. Okay, uh, I'm Cherish Cronmiller. I'm the executive director of Olympic Community Action Programs, uh, as you may know as OLICAP. And just a reminder that uh, the agency has uh, benefits available for individuals um, who are struggling to pay utilities, uh, rent assistance. If you know those that have been affected by COVID and are struggling with any type of utility, okay, that's water, sewer, electric, what, whatever is needed there, along with rent assistance. And Clallam County, Serenity House, our partner, um, is the lead agency, so you can contact them and landlords are allowed to make that contact. And in Jefferson County, we're the lead agency and those forms are available on our website. So um, encourage you know, individuals, landlords um, to you know, come forth and get assistance because you know, with the, the way that the laws are gonna be now with respect to eviction, um, it's gonna necessitate you know, looking to see if you have you know, attempted to get some type of assistance or entered into a payment plan. So we're here and available for that. Um, so, you know, make sure that for those in the community that, you know, are having any type of issues that they reach out. Our agency often has staff at the housing uh, hub available in SWIM. And we're thankful to, you know, the city of SWIM mm -hmm. who often provides us with uh, extra funds to be able to assist people uh, beyond grant dollars that we might have. So. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out anytime, uh, email the agency, reach out to me. I'm always happy to answer questions or talk about the agency. Uh, and it's great to finally see some faces. So thanks so much. Woof, we had a lot to get off of our chests, huh? Um, is there anybody online that would like to make an announcement? If so, just unmute and jump in right now. Susan, go ahead. Thank you, Angie. Hi, I'm, I'm Susan Shoemaker, and I am the Business Assistance Specialist for the North Olympic Development Council. I run the Business Assistance Program for the NODC, which offers practical and technical marketing support for any business located in Clallam or Jefferson counties. This program is free to our local businesses and funded by a federal grant from the CARES Act, and free is a very good price. Uh, the program is in response to the financial impact from shutdowns due to the pandemic. And so far, I've worked with almost 40 local businesses with free one-to-one -one confidential coaching on all things business marketing, including website issues, social media strategies, branding, etc. Each conversation is private, unique, 
and focused on specific business needs and concerns. And currently I'm managing seven website projects for NODC clients. My style is to teach as we work together and it's exciting to hear the growing confidence from business owners. This program is available to any business with a license in Clallam or Jefferson counties. So if there's anything I can do for you, please reach out. I'll put my email in the chat and I'll, um, I've already dropped in the link to the program on our website. So I'm just delighted to hear from local businesses who would benefit from this kind of free support. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna bring up our sponsor, um, which is hopefully not the most verbose person in the room, right, Bruce? Uh, Bruce is here with the Olympic Medical Center Foundation. He has sponsored our luncheon today, so let's give them a big thank you for that. And about what the Olympic Medical Center Foundation is up to these days. So go ahead. Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Angie. Uh, as a lot of you know, the Hospital Foundation exists to raise, uh, to improve the lives of patients at Olympic Medical Center. And we do that by raising money. And uh, we do that through contributions and uh, six events. And the more money, obviously, that we can raise, that allows for even more people to be treated locally instead of uh, having to go out of the area to Seattle, et cetera. So that's a strong desire and mission of ours. Um, I'm pleased to say the last 18 months, we have done extremely well. And it didn't start out that way. Because of uh, COVID, uh, we canceled our golf tournament, which by the way, is back this Friday. And, uh, here in Squim, um, and we postponed our duck race. So we, uh, you know, we would have been very, very happy to raise half of the funds that we had budgeted. But fortunately, we, uh, the last year, we've had a record year. Five out of our six events have set uh, financial records in net revenue. Um, those six, uh, uh, the final one, if you will, will, will be our uh, Sunny Six Killer UW Husky Celebrity Golf Classic. Uh, the tenth event will be held on Friday. Uh, Thursday night, we have a dinner auction here uh, at the casino, and we're looking forward to that. We have 40 Husky celebrities uh, that mostly play football at the University of Washington, but there's baseball players such as Brandon Irvin and Darren Doty. Uh, Brandon went to Port Angeles High School. Darren um, went to Swim High School, but they both played at the University of Washington. Um, our next event in Swim will be September 25th. It's our Harvest of Hope dinner that benefits the Cancer Center. And um, that has grown to be our biggest fundraiser of the year. And funds from that will benefit uh, the new linear accelerator that is uh, going in to treat radiation and our patient navigator program. Um, we uh, provide funds uh, for patients who uh, a lot of times are doing okay financially, but once they are treated for cancer, all of a sudden they're without income. So we provide money for rent, utilities, and other types of expenses. Um, we do four more events. Uh, our Hog Wild Barbecue event um, is uh, a week from this Saturday. Uh, so we have back-to-back -back weekends for events. It's at Harbinger Winery. Um, we have Festival of Trees. Uh, we will hold our 30th Festival of Trees um, Thanksgiving weekend. We have our Red Set Go Heart Luncheon that obviously benefits the Heart Center. So in, in the duck race, as I, I, I mentioned, and we sell ducks in both Port Angeles and Swim. So I appreciate all the sponsorship that a lot of you and contributions that a lot of you have given to the Hospital Foundation over the years. And uh, uh, because, because of that, uh, uh, we've had a great year. And I, and I really wanna thank the people who have stepped up to sponsor. Uh, as you know, many business sectors have not done well in the last 18 months. 
and those that have done well have stepped up to make up for that deficit. Thus, uh, we were able to have a good year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. I'm only slightly disappointed because when you said Husky celebrities, I thought you meant Husky dogs and I was really <laughs> excited. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows why. <laughs> we have a Husky dog as a mascot. I'm there. Fabulous. Well, Daryl has been very patient. Thank you so much for, and we, had, we just had a lot to talk about, um, but today I'm so thrilled that Daryl Wolf from OMC has uh, agreed to come speak about the state of the hospital, and I'm sure um, you guys will have questions for him. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you so much. OMC is our, our largest supporter of the Chamber of Commerce. They're our, our premier platinum sponsor. Um, so thank you so much for supporting the Chamber and doing all the work that you do. So come on up here and tell these folks what's real. <laughs> Thank you for having. Thank you for having me. Um, it, this is the first public uh, 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 presentation I think I've given in a long time. So I'm glad to be not being doing not to not be doing it on Zoom. So, um, how much time do I have? Well, I think people have to back to work, right? It's Chamber of Commerce. Okay. Zoom in. You can zoom in. Okay. Well, I, I have a, I have a long presentation plan. I'll go to the short version. Um, or uh, just to, for those that have to go. So anyway, thanks again for having me. I'm in, in honestly, this feels weird because it's not on Zoom. So I appreciate actually seeing faces and eyeballs and you're live, I could touch you and it's awesome. I won't, but I could touch you. Um, so, so I'll start with some nuts and bolts about Olympic Medical Center. Um, and um, maybe I should say a little bit about who I am. Um, I think I know some of you I know. Um, so uh, I, I've, my name is Daryl Wolf. I'm actually a 1988 um, school and high school graduate. Um, my, my folks, the Wolves, <laughs> wish he was there. Um, and so, so I've lived here for a long time. I went away to school and, and traveled and, and ended up coming back. I actually lived in Squim until, uh, and today I was outside thinking, I don't know why I sold the house I had in Squim because I live in Port Angeles and it's so nice out here. But um, when I got married, I sold the house I had here. We moved to Port Angeles and that's a long story I won't bore you with. Uh, anyway, so I've been around for a long time, um, I, I'm, but I am a transplant from California. This is where you go boo or whatever you guys do. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm not a native. My wife was actually born in Port Angeles. So whenever I tell her I feel like a local, she reminds me that I'm not because she was born at OMC and has lived here almost her whole life. Um, anyway, so um, that's a little bit about me. Um, I have I've, uh, traveled around, but I've been at OMC for 15 years. Um, and, and I've been I've been the CEO for a little over a year when um, Eric Lewis decided to retire. I started in the finance department. Um, I spent about a decade working in finance. I was a CFO for several years. Uh, I was a chief operating officer for about 15 minutes till Eric decided to retire. And then I became, I kind of moved into the interim CEO role and then I was hired for the permanent role last summer. So a little about me, if you wanna know more, I can talk to you after. But a little bit of the, the nuts and bolts of OMC and who we are. Um, so we are a public hospital district. So we're like, kind of like, we're a governmental entity actually. Uh, my bosses are seven publicly elected board members, uh, which is which is very interesting. But they're they're community oriented, well intentioned, um, awesome individuals from a variety of, of uh, uh, places in life, and it's 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 been a great experience. And I will be honest with you, when I took this job, that was the thing that made me the most nervous uh, because you know you don't get you have people you guys are electing these people, and then they help us uh, manage the the organization. So. But they're an awesome group, and I'm very fortunate to have such a great board. But one thing that the board is very passionate about, as am I and all of us on the senior leadership team, is we want to stay locally owned and operated. So I'm taking this off. Ah, I can breathe. <laughs> we want to stay locally owned and operated, and, and uh, we're going to go down fighting to, to maintain that, no matter what that takes. Um, and so to do that, we have a lot of close partnerships um, with a lot of good people. Um, the foundation is a, is a huge partner of ours, and I appreciate everyone's support of the foundation because it really does help us. Um, I was just at the cancer center actually before I came here um, and the Lynn Act is breaking ground. It's really exciting to see that take shape. So, um, but these are multi-million dollar projects. So all those things help. So anyway, uh, but the way we, we want to stay locally and operated is um, we, want, we think the best decisions for Clallam County should be made in Clallam County. 
Uh, other hospitals across the industry, as you may know, are, are becoming larger, part of large organizations. Um, and they go to places like Chicago for their budget approval, or they go to places like Arizona for something, or they go to some places like, and I'm not sure about how connected Chicago is to what's going on in Kitsap, which is their, their parent company is actually based in Chicago. Um, so I think um, what we wanna do is we want um, local control of our healthcare system to the best of our ability. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, so we're right now we have 67 beds. We're a sole community hospital. We have the hospital in, in Port Angeles. We also have the campus here in Swim. We have three other buildings in Port Angeles. We have a, uh, that are not on the hospital campus. We have a, a pediatrics and women's health clinic, and we have a specialty clinic as well as our patient financial services building are not on the main hospital campus. And then here in Squim, as you may know, we have our cancer center, a large medical services building. The old Squim Medical Plaza is ours. And we have some services there as well. We deliver about 480 babies a year or so at OMC. We perform about 8,400 surgical cases per year. Um, and that's a variety of things. That's everything from total joints or total knees and hips to endoscopy type procedures. <laughs> We have ancillary services in both uh, Squim and Port Angeles. We have lab imaging. We have our heart center, which Bruce mentioned, home health. Our home health agency actually goes all the way out to the, to the Pacific. We, like if you look at the state of Washington, the whole north part of the peninsula, our home health agency serves. We have, we have nurses regularly going to Mia Bay, out to La Push, and, and back to Port Angeles and Squim and all the way to the county line here. So home health um, wide, really spread out as well. And then we have rehabilitation services, which is your you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy in both cities as well. Uh, we're a rural referral center. 20% uh, of our admissions actually come from the West End. Uh, there's a, a hospital in Forks um, and they're, they're a small critical access hospital and they do a lot of things really well, but we, we have a little bit more uh, capacity here. So a lot of, our, a lot of folks from, the, from Forks Hospital end up in our hospital and we take care of them there. And those that need additional care often, often go to the to Seattle or Tacoma or other places. We have a level three trauma center. Um, what does that mean? That means we actually have on-call providers 24 seven all the time in general surgery, orthopedic surgery, urology, um, and a couple of others. But basically we have a 24 seven, robust 24 seven operation that includes 24 hour lab, 24 hour imaging. And that gives us that level three uh, trauma designation which is really important to us. And I think all of us in this room. We're financially stable. Uh, our annual budget is three times what it was when I started, which is staggering, uh, but it is about a 200, we have about a $240 million annual budget. Um, we've, met, we've met a couple of our strategic, goal, uh, strategic goals around our financial performance. One of those is our cash reserves. We use a metric called base cash on hand, which basically means if we stop getting paid tomorrow, how long would we survive? Um, we, 90 days has been our strategic plan goal. Um, we're actually raising that to 100, and we've been able to meet that goal uh, at the end of 2020 and maintain it now. We have a really low debt position. So uh, basically what that means is, um, you know, as far as if you look at OMC, like your mortgage, um, your mortgage, let's say your mortgage is $200,000 or your house is worth $200,000 and you owe $60,000 on it, that's roughly 30% of, of, um, of your equity is in debt. Is it called the debt to equity ratio? I won't geek out on you, I promise. <laughs> um, but basically, we're in a really good position. A lot of hospitals have more cash, but they also have a lot more debt. Um, so what we're trying to do is, you know, balance between having low debt, having a good cash position, but also having a small margin. I mean, we operate on a two to three percent margin at best. Um, so no one's, you know, so, but what that does do is it allows us to keep up with principal on that debt, continue to invest in new infrastructure and equipment as well as keep up, you know, try to keep up with the market with respect to salaries, which is always a challenge. Over time, we've continually invested in our infrastructure, our capital budget each year is between 15 and $20 million. Um, and that's everything from x-rays to linear accelerators to uh, uh, medical, uh, medical oncology expansion at the cancer center here, more primary care and so on. Uh, but what we've been able to do is, is continually work on that. So some hospitals um, get themselves in a hole. If you don't continually reinvest your infrastructure, it's like your house. If you just let everything go to pot and then you have to fix it, all of a sudden you have a huge price tag. But if you can kind of maintain it and keep it going, 
um, you, that tends to save you money over time as well as keep things in better operation. And that's what OMC has been able to do for a long time. Um, so, and that's, uh, that, that's way before my time. That's just, that started, that's been a good, we've been fiscally conservative for a long time and that served us well. So our provider services, um, when I started OMC 15 years ago, we, I think had seven or eight employed providers. We now have 110. Uh, we have 110, over 110 employed providers and over 15 specialties. Uh, that is everything from family medicine to orthopedics to pediatrics to sleep medicine. Uh, we have a hospitalist program. So all the providers that you see when you're in the hospital, those are um, employed by us. And they, you know, they kind of round on you when you're in the ICU or in that surge. Um, uh, urology, medical oncology, radiation oncology here at the Cancer Center, cardiology, Bruce talked about the Heart Center. So a wide variety of services that are here. Um, and that's, that's fairly rare for a rural area. Um, but it's something that we're, um, that's part of that growth I've talked about is, you know, our OMP unit now has almost 500 employees in it. Um, and that's, again, it's all OMC to me, but OMP is our multi-specialty provider group and all the ambulatory clinics related to that. So huge expansion there and a lot of growth. Uh, I'm going to shift gears for a second just to talk about um, our strategic plan. Um, our strategic plan has uh, a series of goals in it. Those are um, gone through by our board, senior leadership, and others. Uh, we are currently operating under a strategic plan that was created in 2019. And um, you may know that that was before what I called the vid. I, call, I don't call it COVID. I call it the vid because I'm tired of talking about COVID. My kids think that's funny, so you guys don't. That's okay. <laughs> um, but in our strategic plan, we've always been focused on quality, safety, and patient experience. Um, that is how I think we're gonna make it. I mean, we need to be the provider that you guys wanna to come to because you, we know you can go to St. Michael's, we know you can go to Swedish, we know you can go to these places, but for the stuff that we do, we wanna be doing it as well as they do or better and doing it here. Um, so those are the key factors there. I think if we have high quality, the best safety and great patient experience for all of you, the financial part will, make, will take care of itself. I and mean, that's my job is the advocacy and all the things around reimbursement that we will continue to work on forever and ever and ever. So, but the other stuff, we have to be the provider that you guys want to come to. Community relations. I mean, we, we spent a lot of our time working with partners. I mean, you many of have heard about our affiliation with Swedish Medical Center, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, um, working with Financial Behavioral Health and others over the years. Um, that's part of how we've stayed strong. I mean, we're not, we don't, we're not going to go it alone. I cannot compete with CHI Franciscan, VM, whatever they're called now, Common Spirit, Dignity. You know, now there's 1,800 hospitals and billions of dollars. I, I can't outspend them. But what I can do is work closely with all of you and our local partnerships. And I think together we're stronger and together we'll get where we need to go as a community. Employee engagement, that's a huge part of our strategic plan. Just like all of you, uh, we have staffing shortages. Um, right now we have 218 open positions at OMC. Um, many of those are nurses, many of those are medical assistants that work in our clinics, um, but, but it's across the spectrum. Um, but I think, uh, you know, that's, so employee engagement is a huge, I just came from an employee barbecue that we threw kind of on a whim last week. And so that's why I was afraid I was a little late, but it wasn't. So, um, so anyhow, uh, employee engagement is very important to us. Our employees are our most important resource. And I'm not just saying that it's true. I cannot take care of patients. If I did, it'd be really awful um, for the patient. Um, I, I can't do surgery, but I, I can do what I do. And, and our employees do, I mean, it takes 1600 people to run OMC every day. Not me, um, it takes all of us to do it together. So our employees are very important to us. Medical staff relations, our medical staff is very important to us as well. We have over 200 employ, uh, providers on medical staff. So what that is, that's the broader medical staff. That's not just who we employ. Uh, that's, um, that's, that's the folks from James, the Jamestown Clinic here that are on our medical staff. That's the folks from the North Olympic Healthcare Network. That's some of the, the radiology re group we work with that's in, based in Seattle. And so, so that our medical staff is really important to us and, and our function. Infrastructure, I talked a little bit about my theories around infrastructure. And I talked about financial stewardship. Those are all components of our strategic plan. And there's quite a few goals in there, um, but we are retooling that strategic plan uh, because the vid happened and um, the, the landscape has definitely changed. Um, and it's changed for all of us, but it's, it's also changed a lot in healthcare and how we have to do things. Um, it's also left a lot of folks that we see in the hospital and in the clinics, they're in crisis. They are, they are having a hard time. They're really having a hard time. 
Uh, so our new strategic plan um, is going to have a little bit more specific focus on how we work with behavioral health. And that's um, gonna be working a lot with PDH and, and other partners, but also how do we care for these folks when they are in our system? How do we, how we do the best we can for these people because they need our care too. Workforce, I talked about that. That will continue to be a huge focus for us. Uh, reimbursement I mentioned, um, we 83% of our revenue comes from some form of government payer source, whether that's Medicaid, Medicare, or some of the smaller government payers that are sprinkled around a lot of public employees that have retired. Um, so that's a, that's a tough equation. Uh, most, a lot, not most, many hospitals, um, they balance the books on the commercial payers, which are more, uh, which pay a little bit better in essence. Uh, we, we have a small slice of that. So we really are in a tough spot. So we spent a lot of our time um, with in, in Olympia and in DC, uh, pleading our case with our legislators to let make sure they don't forget about us out here and let us know. I, we, we spend a lot of time letting them know all the good work that we do and, and make sure that they keep that in mind as they make a lot of regulation and changes and stuff. Um, so wait, retooling the strategic plan, and this isn't the new guy coming in, blowing up a plan, starting another one. Um, this is uh, really probably 85% or 75% of the current plan is awesome and will stay the same, but it's, you know, things that we've got, we've accomplished and operationalized, those will be uh, taken out and more focus on these items is, is what our intent is. And I had, we've had a series of public forums and some of you may have attended and I appreciate your comments and feedback and emails and all that and we're taking that into account. So our COVID response, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it COVID just because you guys don't think that joke's funny. So, um, First off, I want to thank you all for your flexibility. When you've come to use our services around visitation, that has been one of the hardest things for us to deal with because our number one goal is to keep our staff and our patients safe. And unfortunately, that's come at the cost of patients and loved ones of patients and caregivers of patients who we've had to keep out of the hospital. And that's been really hard. And I just want to say those decisions were not made lightly. We're doing the best we can because we, you know, we're, this, these, this, is, this is happening to us all of the time um, and we're just trying to do the best we can. So I just wanna appreciate any of you that have, have been across our, our doorsteps um, to, to, to thank you for that flexibility. And I know it's been hard because I get all of the letters about when it's not. Um, and masking, you know, these, I think these really are helping us. Um, our best line of defense right now, I know not everyone's vaccinated, I'm not gonna go there, but um, masking, good hygiene with your hands, keeping your distance. I mean, I think we need to keep doing that as we look, talk about things like this Delta variant, which is some exponentially amount of times worse than what we've been dealing with before is really serious for us. And it's something that we worry about a lot uh, because um, if, it's as, if it's as transmissible as they say, it could overwhelm our system pretty fast. Um, so I appreciate everyone paying attention to those things because that does help us. Um, so COVID, um, so we spent about $10 million dealing with our COVID response last year. And that's a variety of things. That's salaries, that's locums providers, that's, we, do, we did not lay people off. We did not cut salaries. Uh, and we made that decision very consciously because when a surge happens, what do you need the most? Well, you need your people to come back. So if you just gave them the pink slip, the odds of them coming back is probably that much. Um, you know, so, we redeployed a lot of people. Now, if you visited our um, our facility, you know we've got we had people at all the entrances and taking temperatures and doing all these things. So we redeployed a lot of staff, uh, but we spent a lot of money on PPE. There was a period of time where uh, an N95 mask, which usually costs about a dollar and ten cents, cost six dollars, um, and we bought tens of thousands of those because that's all we could get. Um, testing. We have a testing site that we've had stood up for over a year. Um, out on the east side of the hospital. Um, that's cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. We didn't have the staff to do that. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's so we've, we've put a lot into it, but I think um, I, I'm, I'm proud of what we have done. I'm also proud of, the, of working with public health and the other agencies. Like I know Jamestown had a huge effort out here. That was awesome. We helped a little bit, but they, they took the lead on that, which I appreciate tremendously. Um, so it's been, definitely been a community effort, but it was it definitely was an economic um, issue for OMC. Uh, I will say that the CARES Act funding that did come through for us did make us whole on a lot of those things, but we still lost a fair amount. We lost about three and a half million on operations last year. So um, so an impact there for sure. Um, and we do we are still working on a, a vaccination clinic strategy. 
Um, if you come to any of our clinics, um, we have a drive up that we're utilizing and, and we're still getting some of that, um, uh, some of those vaccinations in arms and we're still working on that as well. So um, that's a little bit of where we are with COVID. Um, I'll talk a little bit about SQUIM and kind of what our plans are out here uh, for now. Um, and, and this, the medical oncology cancer, can, the medical oncology side of the cancer center expansion was completed uh, earlier this year. Um, and that added a, a lot of uh, chemotherapy um, uh, capacity as well as a much larger pharmacy. The old pharmacy was um, maybe as big as this thing. So it was really small. Um, now they have a real pharmacy. So that's really good and has all the, um, the hoods and everything that you need to really take care of those drugs in an appropriate way that's safe for patients and staff. Um, so that we got that one done, which was great. Uh, the, I mentioned the, the second linear accelerator, um, you know, that's, that's about a $6 million lift for us. Um, so the foundation has helped us tremendous, tremendously on that, that all, all these things help. But the reality is, is we haven't cured cancer yet. I wish we had. Um, so the need for those services continue to grow, unfortunately. Also the old linear accelerator, which at the time was the second one on the West coast, Stanford had the first and we had the second. I remember Eric just bragged about that a lot. We thought it was awesome. Um, now that thing's 10 years old. And so it, there's just a need to have some redundancy um, because of that as well, as well as unfortunately the volumes are still there. Uh, many of you have probably heard about um, our attempt to sue CMS, which I like to brag about um, because of the site neutral ruling that came out a couple of years ago. I won't bore you with all that, but I will just say that um, that really had an impact on our development plans in SQUIM. I spent two years of my life when I was a CFO developing a really grand plan with a ambulatory surgery center and a big giant primary care building and a master plan and all these things. We've had to kind of like pause on that. We are, we have, we will be maintaining all services and still incrementally growing the ones that we have. That is our plan. Uh, but that, that decision definitely took the wind out of our sails uh, because what it effectively did was any, 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 any hospital-based entity that's not within 250 yards of our main hospital took a 60% cut on, um, a good chunk of the reimbursement basically. Um, and that to us was about 4 million per year. Um, we did some, we did some uh, uh, interesting things in Port Angeles uh, to try to mitigate some of that because this is only for the Medicare population. Um, so we were able to move some of the, some of the more Medicaid heavy um, uh, services away from the hospital, move more of the Medicare service, more Medicare heavy closer to the hospital. And that mitigated a lot of that. But unfortunately, no matter what we do in SWIM, you're still 17 miles away. So. Uh, we are uh, we are still absorbing about a million and a half dollars a year in cuts as re as a result of that decision. Um, the the legal the legal challenge has has gone it has run its course. We did not win there. However, we have, we do have a lot of local support from um, Congressman Derek Kilmer, uh, and he is a huge advocate of OMC. He actually happens to have been born there, and um, uh, so we're looking for some other legislative ways to try and uh, mitigate those cuts. Um, so I wanted to share that with you as well. Some new stuff. So I mentioned the new strategic plan, which will be launched, I should say, in August. Um, next month, we're hoping to launch that. Uh, we are looking into the uh, uh, hospice type program. That's something that we haven't done. And we're trying to, still trying to understand that. Um, but we're, it looks like there is, a, there is a shortage in the area. We're looking at, at, we're looking at possibly looking at hospice going forward. But one of the two of the big projects that I'm working on right now, or I should say we're all working on, is one of them is reconfiguring our current hospital building. Uh, parts of the main hospital building are 71 years old. And um, it's like I said, it's been well maintained. We've been able to continue to invest in it. Um, but it needs a lot. And what we've done over the years is we've added pieces, right? And so now we have this, this puzzle and we look at it and go, oh, why do we do it that way? And why is it, why is the OR over there and the pre-ops over there? And you got to wheel them across the hospital. So we're, we're going to embark on looking at the hospital as if, what would we like to look, what would we like, sorry, I'm losing my voice. What would we like for the hospital to look like in 10 years? And then how do we build towards that in an incremental fashion um, through a series of phases? Um, the most immediate needs are, we don't have enough beds. Um, we had to take Basically, we had to kick a bunch of people out of offices on our second floor to build a surge, a COVID surge um, wing, if you will, 15 beds, because we're anticipating a COVID surge, which they're still set up. We are still anticipating that surge. I hope it doesn't happen, but we are still prepared for that. 
Um, you know, and so we're, we're, we need more inpatient beds. And it's not that we overflow necessarily, but it's we run out of ICU beds where we only have nine. At this morning, we had eight people in beds. Um, so there's only one extra one. Um, so so how, do we, how do we better use the building that we have? And I think increasing beds, we currently have 67 operating beds because we've done away with a lot of the double rooms that used to be a little more common. Uh, when, I got, when I got to OMC in 2006, we had 78 beds, but we moved all doubles to singles, which was good. It's a great thing, but now we need more. Um, so we're working on that. We're also gonna be looking at our surgical services. Uh, we recently did a pretty significant remodel to the basement that finished earlier this year. We have new capacity with respect to our central sterile processing, which cleans like all the instruments that you see in all the clinics and in the OR and in the floors. Um, so that's given us some new capabilities there that maybe that could trickle into how we do surgeries. Um, and this will be something that will likely cost um, a lot <laughs> working on that, but it'll probably be something we'll accomplish over you know, a decade or so. And, and we'll be looking at a phasing approach to that. The second um, project that's, that's actually underway right now is um, a medical staff development plan. What we wanna understand is, um, you know, what do we need in this community? What do we need? What does Clallam County need? How many primary care do we need? Primary care docs do we need? How many urologists should we have, et cetera? Uh, we did one of these in 2013. And in 2013, for example, um, our group had 40 providers in it and now it has over 110, like I said. So we've grown a lot. Jamestown has changed. The North Olympic Healthcare Network, which used to be Family Medicine in Port Angeles, they have changed. We, so the, the, the system has changed here, um, as well as, um, We've all gotten a little older, right? Um, I get older every day, and uh, some days I really know. But it's, I think what, it, what, what we're getting at is, what are the demographics? What are the type of illnesses that we're seeing in the community? And how do we build a medical staff that is geared to take care of them, I mean, in essence? So what it does, it looks at the current capacity, forecasts um, you know, uh, population growth and um, you know, I sent them a ton of information on the illnesses that we see. So it's, the idea is to put a puzzle together or to build a roadmap of where, you know, where do we want to go? And that should help us with our recruiting efforts and other things where uh, we, we have a good plan now, but it'll help reinforce that plan. But more importantly, I think it'll help us know where do we need to grow our own services and where do we work, need to work with others? Um, I mean, I know um, I, I get often asked about when are you going to hire a rheumatologist? When are you going to hire an endocrinologist? Um, those two come up a lot, and I and I hear you, uh, but it's really hard to have a one doctor program because that call is brutal because they're they're always on call, right? So it's so that's where we need to understand, you know, how are, how is this going to transform over time, and where do we go it alone and get and grow our own bench, and where do we work with others to provide the services that 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 we need here? So that's another big project, and I think that and this hospital master plan, I think are really gonna give us a roadmap going forward um, as far as kind of what the vision of the organization will be um, and stuff. So uh, so that's my presentation. It's longer than I promised, I think. Um, Great. But I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have about anything and I appreciate your attention and not falling asleep. Can I have some water? Right. Well, I actually kind of started off with my question. Yes. I get this question almost every day from people walking in the front door at the visitor center. Good. Which is, when are we going to get an ER? <laughs> well, that's a that's another project, um, and I'm happy to answer that question. So, what we are doing right now is is there's a there's a there's a lot to that question. I'm going to preface it with that. Uh, as I mentioned, a 24/7 service requires 24/7 stuff and right now our service in squim is is very much um seven days a week but it's just during the day seven days a week being our walk-in um you're the best thank you um hang on a sec so what we are doing is um and the way the rules are are, are currently written because of where squim is located relative to jefferson healthcare in port, or port townsend and omc in port angeles Having another hospital here does not is is not allowable per the CMS guidelines right now. So, so there's that. Um, and then I think the the uh, the what we are doing is is I'm trying to understand. Um, and I've actually hired someone to help me with this analysis. Is what can we do? I mean that that's the question I'm trying to answer because I've heard that and I've heard it many times and I know that's been simmering for quite a number of years. And I understand um, 
many of the reasons. But what I will share with you is that the, um, the, the budget for OMC's ER is $10 million a year. That does not include 24 seven docs. That does not include 24 seven lab. It does not include 24 seven imaging. It does not include staff, the, the, the registration staff. So, so it's a major undertaking. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie to you. So what my goal is is to, um, having an analysis done, I'd like to present to the city of Squim at an appropriate time. I've already talked with Sharice, who's the interim city manager, and just lay it all out there. It's like here here it is, you guys. This is this is what we can do. And maybe there's a maybe there's a path here, but I don't know what that is at this time. And I know that question gets asked a lot. And I've also seen that um, uh, you know, city council, especially I've heard I've heard some people running for the elections are talking about this, and um, uh, I, I can appreciate why they're asking. But um, I, I don't. I, I think the, the twenty minute. I know, and I know, and I've heard Ben Andrews speak about you know turnaround times, and I, I get all that. Trust me. But I think this is a massive undertaking, and what I need to be sure of is that whatever we do do is fiscally responsible for the entire district, um, which is all of us. Um, so more to come, I guess. Is that's a long way of saying more to come. But do know it is work is being worked on, and um, uh, again, there's some regulations that aren't exactly in our favor um, to, to do this, and um, this this would be a massive undertaking that you know maybe we can do it. But I think right now we're still in the discovery phase. So yeah. does that help? Definitely. <laughs> yeah. It is a long 20 minutes to get to Port Angeles to the ER, but when you get there, you get great service. So that's thank you for that. I can say yeah. from personal experience, yeah. holding my arm for 20 yeah. minutes. Yeah. No, thank you for that. Yeah. And I know I know it's not ideal, and it's it's um, I'd rather be two minutes away myself. I get it. Anybody else in the audience has a question, come over to you. I'm going to sit. So I just retired from the hospital board in Boise. Excellent. During COVID. Oh. And unfortunately, we had the experience of having to go to ER with my husband mm -hmm. since we moved to East Port Angeles. And I guess I'm concerned having moved back to the peninsula, growing up here, the demographics, the people that are moving here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and are we prepared? Are the staff, I mean, the staff has obviously performed well, but do we have enough staff for an emergency, a true emergency? And I know that trying to get an established doctor right now is almost impossible. Yeah. So it's it's very frightening if you're over 65. Yeah. Well, what I can tell you is we do we do have the staff to take care of the services that we provide currently. But like I said, we, we are also getting creative with how we get that staff. A lot of the staff we have in the hospital right now is on contract. They don't, they're not actually employed because that's, that's all that's out there. Um, and the shortage that we are experiencing is experienced across the state and across the nation. And um, so what we're looking at actually right now is uh, our ends right now are, especially in the hospital setting, um, in the ER and on our ICU unit, um, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty um, highly skilled group of folks. And so what we're almost looking at now is how do we look at RNs the way we used to look at physicians? You know, how do we extend those skills out to, so they can take care of a broader number of folks? So we're looking at some strategies around, you know, L, we're make, I'm making this up, LPNs, uh, nurse techs, more emergency room technicians. Um, the goal is to employ, excuse me, get our own um, uh, workforce of our ends, but we know that's going to take some time. So we are looking at creative ways to do it, but you're in good hands. So I, I want to make sure you understand that. But, but yeah, we, we have a staffing uh, challenge right now, for sure. I, I won't, I can't, I can't fib about that. I want to thank you for the depth and breadth of your presentation. It's amazing how much territory you covered in a relatively short time. Very impressive. Thank you. I'm curious, you said that there are over 216, I think, open positions here. You just spoke about that a little bit. Is that a function at any level of your budget or is that more a function of just lack of skilled help available region-wide? Yeah, the latter. I uh, went out to find a heart doc here, mm -hmm. did my homework and had to wait four months. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Do you, you pretty much have to almost die with a heart thing to get a heart appointment mm -hmm. without being anything but pragmatic about it. Sure. And I finally discovered that the way to get attention was to be almost dead, go to the emergency room, have them notice you're almost dead, and then you get the appointment with the doc. I moved up three and a half months by going to your emergency clinic. Is that happening to lots of people or are people just headed east to 
go to the better staffed, larger facilities in Seattle? Uh, well, the, the first part of the question is, is the staffing shortage is not a function of our budget. All those, all those open positions are actually in our budget. We just can't fill them. Uh, and the answer to your second question is, um, I, I'm not sure that's the first story for quite like that one, um, but we, we, uh, we do have wait times with some of our providers, no question. And cardiology is one area where uh, there is a, again, there is a shortage. Um, and we, we just hired a new uh, part -time, uh, half time Dr. Krishnan, who just started with us. Um, and we actually are looking for two more. So we're, we're actively trying to recruit these folks because your experience is not the one I, want, I wanted you to have. Um, and that's not how it should go. Um, but we're doing all we can on the recruiting front. And that's, um, but what I would share with you is, um, I, and I can't speak to specifically each hospital, but I know that, you know, cardiology, for example, urology, for example, and I talked about RNs and others, the shortage that we experience is, el is elsewhere. And I don't know what your condition is. And that's, I don't, I don't need to know, but, you know, in some, in some other settings, I, I don't, I don't know that they're more robustly staffed than we are, but they definitely have more critical mass. So that maybe is a, is a, is something that they're doing because there's, they have a bigger team. So yeah, no, thanks for the question. And um, we're, we are working on it. I promise. All right. Well, I'm one of those people that could use a rheumatologist. So I'll just put that okay. out there. All right. Noted. And thank you so much. I have a question. Someone has a question on the phone. Go ahead. This is I'm Tom Sutton, and I wanted to know what's what is your foreseeable uh, role, the hospital's role with the new meth lab as that comes on board. Swim. Oh the oh the oh the mat clinic. Yes. Oh okay. Sorry sorry sorry. I'm with you now. Well that's that's um. That's James. I mean, that's a Jamestown project. I mean, and we do we we do support that, but I um, but that's something that the Jamestown Clinic has been kind of going on their own with. Does that kind of okay? Question? But that's probably true. But I think when it first came on board, it was a partnership was built uh, the hospital and the Jamestown people. You know. No, when they when they when they started the healing campus, there was they were looking at a multi-phase approach. But the Matt Clinic was the first phase, and that was um, Jamestown's um, uh, that was their project. I know that Matt services are offered in other places in the in the community as well, though. So um, that's not the only location. Okay, cool. Or won't Thank be you. when it comes. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, well, thanks, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's all uh, for you. you. All right, thank you guys for hanging in with us. I know it's been a little bit of a long day, but um, really important information. Let's give Daryl another round of applause there. All right, so like Jim said, our next luncheon will be on August 24th. Not here, it will be outside in the glorious sun at Pioneer Park. Um, so make sure to register for that and keep your eyes peeled for our August newsletter, which has all of our events, information, announcements, and useful information should be in your inbox on August 2nd. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you guys next time.